some some yanam on and I'm going to preface it with a uh, a non hagada word, but it's hagada word. You'll see in a moment what I mean. Um, there is a, uh, a thought I want to share from Yechezkel Abramsky on uh, the chatzotzros that Moshe Rabbeinu was instructed to make in Hashdalos, and uh, Moshe Rabbeinu was instructed to fashion for himself a set of trumpets. Uh, and uh, what's unusual about it is the mitzvahs make for yourself two trumpets of silver and those trumpets are not going to be handed over to your shul they are for the gathering of the tzibor and the apostle instructs exactly you know exactly how to blow to gather for what particular events but those chatzot's roads, Moshe Rabbeinu only, don't pass on to Yeshua, they don't go on to the next generation. So Rebecca Abramsky observes quite accurately that everything else that Moshe Rabbeinu builds is for all generations. And he builds a Mishkan, and the Mishkan is for all time. Uh, the Kale he builds, the auto that is put together for all time. And the, the chatzot's roads are not one and done. Rebecca Abramsky said a beautiful idea. So the Kalim of the Beis Hamikdash, the Olam represents Torah. And Torah is eternal. Torah does not change. The values of Torah are eternal. The message of Torah is eternal. The Torah itself is immutable and eternal. What are the Chatzosros? So the Chatzosros are the call to the Torah. Right? They're, they're the clarion call to gather people to come to Torah. Mm-hmm. Because what Bramsky said, a beautiful idea, he said, Torah doesn't change. But the call to Torah changes every generation. What, what is the call to Torah? What is it that gets people excited, interested? What piques their interest? What, pe- what makes people want to come that's very different? And the things that maybe a generation ago would have gotten people excited today don't. And the things that today do, the next generation down may not. The reason I, I preface with that is that their look on the Haggadah are great and they're wonderful. And, you know, ideas and thoughts and deeper ideas and fun ideas, they're great and wonderful. But all of us, really, our responsibility before going to the Seder is to stop, to think, who's at my Seder? What is going to pique their interest and my interest together? How can I develop the Seder in a way that's going to be enjoyable and interesting for everybody who's there? And too often, there's a disconnect. You know, some, some people are frustrated in Russia Yeshiva. They never made it there. Some people are frustrated in Rabban. They, so they may want to give a drasha. I heard a, a story, uh, just a, a terribly, terribly sad story of a parent who sends his children away from the Shabbos Yomta table regularly. Why? Because he can't conduct the Shabbos table he wants to conduct with them there. <laughs> it's tragic. It's tragic. And, uh, you know, so the job of the Seder is to create a, an atmosphere that, that's one that's open and that's, there's dialogue, there's interest. And, you know, it may not be the one that you dreamt of since you were a child. It may be the one you have. But you're, you're going to do much better if you spend the time thinking, preparing, and catering to the, um, <clears throat> the audience that you'll have. I would recommend, I know it's a crazy out-of-the-box recommendation, you can go onto YouTube and you can Google great teachers and you can watch some great teachers in action and see what they do. Because at the Seder, your job is to be a teacher. The Seder is the call to Torah. Your job is to be a teacher. And, you know, you can throw out questions for discussion and dialogue. And it, it, the Haggadah is, is an essential, central element to the Seder. But if you're, you know, look, if your brisket is dried out, so your meal didn't succeed. If your Agolta is dried out, your Seder didn't succeed. And so if it's just dry and it's not there, I was telling this to the boys in Yeshiva yesterday, we had an uh, interesting event, you'll see it on the news, um, if you watch News 12. You see, we had the, the head of the, uh, the regional chapter, the NAACP, come down to Yeshiva and speak to the boys. About freedom. About, about no, it wasn't really about freedom, but it was about uh, you know, racism and ethnic groups and the like. Who's, who, who's that AC? What is that? The National Association of Advancement of Colored People. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, which was nice, he said, you know, no, we're all different color. color. Correct. We're all a color. But, um, but I spoke to the boys yesterday, 
And I told them that I, I start my Seder every year. Every single year I start my Seder, not with the Rav Chaim, not with the, you know, or salvage idea, not with the, uh, the brisker of. I start with the discussion of what do you think being a slave would feel like to you? Especially for the, for the young and the old also. Uh, from all, all the age groups, you know, let's, let's get into what slavery would be like. And, and after a, what, what's a, hopefully an energetic and robust discussion about what slavery means. And, you know, it's always fascinating to see what slavery means to different age groups. You know, at the age of six, slavery means that you can't play your, your Game Boy or your DS or whatever it is, whatever you want. But that, that's, that frames the entire Seder then. Okay, you know, I'm the farm of the 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 ultimate goal of the Seder is if you can replicate on some level the feeling or the experience of slavery and replicate the experience of leaving slavery, that, that's a successful Seder. And if your Seder takes an hour, including the meal, and you do that, uh, that's, you have achieved the ultimate success of your Seder. It takes, you know, you come into Shul the next morning, and you say to your neighbor, I'm sorry, we're still in the middle of the Seder, I just left to go daven. We're coming back in, it's to finish, right? But, uh, you know, you've tortured everything. I guess, Avdus, they felt. Uh, you know, what it's like, I'm both as para, but you haven't gotten Cheros in yet. So, it's important to bear that in mind, that we should not measure ourselves by the yardstick of how long other people start or going, how many different Torah, which very, look, which uh, the yardstick we measure by is that I succeed in replicating for myself and my audience a feeling of enslavement and, and a feeling of freedom. And, you know, that can and should be illustrated by pe things that people can reference. And it does not have to necessarily have to be only in, in the Jewish world, meaning that if we can evoke in people an image of slavery by invoking other ethnic groups and their suffering, well then, you know, that, that frames it for us and gives us an understanding and that's very important. I always say every year, it is mind-boggling that people can prepare for the holiday that commemorates our freedom from slavery and gives us an eternal requirement to remember that we were slaves in Mitzrayim. They can prepare for it by mistreating the help they get in the house and the grocery stores. I mean, does, does anybody not see the incongruity there? You remember you were a slave, you missed a spot. <laughs> right? <laughs> remember you were a slave, Mitzrayim, yeah, that's the value, and if we, if we get everything else and we miss that, so I think we missed the, the Seder. I'm going to share with you some thoughts, but with that preface, again, it's all, these, these are all parpares, they're all the spice. Someone once asked, um, Rabbi Mordechai Willig from YU to compare his shear to his Rebbe's shear. He's a Talmud of Rabbi Salvechik, Rabbi Yosher Rabbi Salvechik. And someone asked him to compare his shear to his Rebbe's shear. So he said, said well, he said, by my Rebbe, the meat and potatoes, they're his. By me, I just add the spice. Mm -hmm. right? The meat and potatoes are someone else, I add the spice. So this is to add the spice to the Savior. A little bit of, of fun ideas that could provoke thought. And, and discussion, but add the spice. The Chidah is, is a fascinating comment. The Chidah works very much with Chidah's from Chaim Yosef David Azulai, who was one of the great Sephardic uh, giants of the 18th century, and uh, he wrote you know, different numbers. Some say 76 Sephardim, some say 110 Sephardim. To me, once you get past 50 Sephardim, you're already, you know, in rarefied air. You don't have to give it a number anymore. So he says that the, if you look at the Halach Mahanya, which starts the Haggadah, Starts with Halach Ma Anyo, the Achlo of Asan of Arab Israel. So, Chol Dichvin Yisayifu, Chol Dichvin Yisayifu. So we know the the language of it, of course. The um, the Chido writes here that the words that start the Halach Ma Anyo, Halach Ma Anyo, the Achlo of Asan of Arab Israel. You add up the first letters of each word. Hey, Lamed Ayin, Dalit Aleph, Aleph. Bays and uh, Dalin. So the entire Russian table is eight up in the Machi to 117. 117. Now, what's the significance of 117? This is the following beautiful idea. He says, We know that we were in Mitzrayim for 210 years. But we know that our slavery in Mitzrayim didn't last 210 years. Because the time Mitzrayim is counted for the time that Yaakov went down, Redu Shah, right? Went down to Mitzrayim. 
and then we left. When does the slavery begin? So Rashi, the beginning of Vayechi, tells us that the slavery begins with the death of the last of the Shvat. Who was the last of the Shvatim to die? Levi. How many years after Levi died did we remain in Mitzrayim as slaves? 117 years. 117 years. And therefore, the Halakhanya begins with the Gematria of 117, the beginning of the words, signifying the 117 years that we were in slavery in Israel. Uh, Chidon adds another thought. Last year we spent a lot of time, the second half of that other, we spent a lot of time on the first half this year. We can come every second year, <laughs> every half you like. And they say the story of a guy who, um, who came exactly a half hour late to the hour long Dafyomi Shir every morning. So he, he was a bucky at Omen Bay's in the of Shas, but <laughs> not, not so well. The, um, the Chidot here says the following idea in the Lachmanya. He, he brings down the Gemara himself. Gemara himself says that but that means is that one, one, you have to get all the Hebrew down. Um, <laughs> the uh, the a person is allowed to fill himself up with dough that comes from a non-Jew as long as he has a kizayis of shmur matz at the end. In other words, when, when I sit down at the Seder, so some people have a hakpada, they only eat shmur matz all Pesach. Some people will eat shmur, non-shmur matz, what we call non-shmur, meaning you know, the old yellow box, right? They'll eat it the rest of the week, um, but not at the Seder. And some people will go with the main halakha, which is that really, as long as I have regular matzah, the entire, uh, uh, rather, I have shmur matzah at the end, the kezayis, I can have regular non shmur matzah the rest of the time. So he says that the double language in the halach ma'anyo, right, the, the double language there is that kol dichven yisayi if you're hungry, you can come eat. I have plenty of harwoods, margaret, and stripes, and for you to eat, fill up. The kol vitzrich, you need to do the mitzvah, then ye say to yisach, you'll come, and you'll have that kezayis of matzah at the end that fulfills the mitzvah of the matzah on Pesach. Uh, Sam Sofer has a, a thought, it's a beautiful thought, and it ties into the Lavadji Rebbe that I mentioned on Shabbos by Shal Shudas. Um, I've been making the way I mentioned Shabbos, Shal Shudas. I have a colleague who got me the Lavadji Rebbe's Haggadah this year for Pesach. It's uh, fabulous. He has very, very brief comments on Lavadji, each one is so rich. He has lengthier pieces, many of them in Yiddish. So it's really been a challenge for me because Yiddish is not my first, second, or I think my third language. I do better in Spanish, believe it or not. <laughs> so, um, but I've been, I've been trying to make my way through it. And he has a beautiful piece comparing the Lachmoni and Mansashira. What is the, what are the values of the two? Some Silver is a very similar idea of the following question. It says that we have halacha. Laura Ibsachim, again, that you can only be Yotse Matzah with that which is Bali Dechimus, that which can become Chametz. It's Lamad Zayim. The Laura Ibsachim has, you can only be Yotse Matzah with that which can become Chametz. If it can't become Chametz, you can't be Yotse Matzah with So, for example, uh, for our Sephardic brethren who eat rice on Pesach, you know, you would think the easiest thing in the world is make a rice matzah, you know, a rice cake, it goes down easier also, but make a rice matzah, then you don't have to make yourself crazy. You, know, you go to the matzah bakery and the, 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 the clock starts ticking, the buzzer goes off, it's 18 minutes, you know, everybody's running, running back and forth. You work, you make it much easier, make it much safer. Make a matzah out of something you can't become chametz. So the Chassam Sofer wants to know why. Why do we have to have matzah specifically out of that which can become chametz? So he says a beautiful idea. He says that the, the truth is that we sometimes tend to, uh, to misunderstand our role in the world. There's a beautiful Meshech Chachma, which I always quote. Meshech Chachma is in Parshas of uh, Hazin. Moshe Rader says, Ki Shem Hashem Ekro, Chavagod Lelokein. You know, we say as the intro to Mincha Shemon Esrei on a daily basis, Ki Shem Hashem Ekro, 
when I call out the name of God, Hava Godel Elokeinu, you will give glory to our Lord. That's the source, according to the Rosh, for saying Baruch Hu Baruch Shemo, when you hear a bracha, because we're supposed to be honored when we hear God's name. Okay, so what is the meaning of it? It says the Meshech of the following. He says, the two names of God that are represented in that posse, Hashem, Yud Kei Vav Kei, versus Elokeinu, represent two different aspects of God. Now, one we know represents the aspect of strict just mercy rather versus strict justice, but there's another meaning as well, and that is that the Shem Hashem Yud Kei Vav Kei represents God revealing himself openly in the world. Open miracles. When God comes and splits the sea, that's Yud Kei Vav Kei. That's God showing his presence constantly in the world. Then there's another name of God, Elohim. Elohim, that's, that's the God that created the world and, so to speak, lets the world run. Meaning where, where God hides himself in nature. The Rosh Hashanah created a natural world and on a day-to-day -day basis, seas don't split. Mountains don't fall. You know, the, the, the heavens don't open up. On a day-to-day -day basis, we have to see God in nature. Says the Meshechachma, Bnei Yisrael in the Midbar lived a life of Hashem, Yudke Vavke, meaning that in the desert they lived a life where, you know, you were hungry, you went outside, mud fell from the heavens, you were thirsty, and there's a, a rock there that's constantly pouring forth water. Uh, you, 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 you lived in, in clouds that enveloped you in the desert, not only Akhavim, you lived a, a supernatural life, and the Meshechachma's lotion is, is there a purpose to that? Is there a purpose? Meaning, says the Meshachach, well, God didn't create Malachim on this earth for a reason. He created human beings. Because he has plenty of Malachim. In Shemayim, God has no limit of angels and no need for more angels. He created man in this world to work in this world to be part of this world, and yet in that framework, in that realm, to still be able to serve God and do the right thing. The Meshach says the Pasuk means Yishem Hashem Ekron. Moshe Rebbe says, when here in the desert, I am giving you the revealed miracles, but you see the Shem Hashem so clearly, that's really just to give you a foundation of Hobo Gold to the That's to give you a foundation. When you go with Derek's install, you go with Derek's Kanaan, and now you're going to live a life of the Asafto, the Gonef, of the Sirosh, of the Yitzarev. You're going to get up and go to work in the morning. You're going to come home at night. You're going to build. You're going to plant. You're going to make your life a natural life. So there you'll be able to extract and see God in the natural world. What's the Meshach Chachmah's point? Meshach Chachmah's point is that God didn't create us to be angels. He created us to be men. And man has the ability to rise higher than the angel. Why? Because the Malach has no Yetzara. The Malach has no, no tendency to do wrong. So what's the great, you know, what's the big deal? I once had a, uh, a gentleman in the Kola by us in Yeshiva who was very critical of, uh, of boys playing basketball. He was very against ball play. So he one time pulled aside a boy and he gave him a schmooze about playing basketball. And he said, I don't play basketball. So I was very upset by it. I think the ball playing is very healthy for kids and very good. So I told the guy, the way you play basketball, to give up basketball is no big deal. Right? When you play basketball, anybody would give up basketball. Right? And, you know, this kid's good. Uh, for a mama not to, not to violate this, a mom doesn't need it. <laughs> leave you, there's, there's no leg. You gotta leave your hole with your There's no leg. But for us as human beings, where we have the Yetzir Haro, but we conquer it, that's the goal. Says the Chassam Sofer, that's the symbolism of Masa. Because what is the Chometz? Chometz is represented, the Radvaz writes in the Chilos, the Radvaz was asked a question, I mentioned it by the Lofash here this evening, that Chometz on Pesach is never bought. No. Also the Masha, means that if you have the slightest amount of Chometz, it will render the entire mixture in which it falls halachically forbidden. Render it also. So Radvaz was asked, why is this? Well, every other Isser, there's a ratio, a bittel. Why come it's not? The Radvaz, from David Ibn Zimru, who was the Rav of the Jewish community of Cairo in the 1500s, and 
the Tose for most of the Jewish world. He answered the following. He said, I don't know, but the only hint I can find is the following. There's a Gemara in Brachos. And the Gemara in Brachos says that Ritzoneinu lasos Ritzoncha. Our desire is to do, 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 do your desire, God. Umama Ake, what holds us back? Seor Shebedis. The sourdough, the leaven in the dough. So says the Gemara, what is the metaphor that the Gemara uses for the Yetzirah? Sor Shabbis, it's the leaven in the dough. Said the Radbaz, so that may be why, since the Yetzirah is the, is the, uh, is the Chomet, that may be why Chomet is also the Masha. So I'm so says that's the idea of Matzah. Matzah is, yeah, it's true, you could be a Malach, and you could make your Matzah out of something that can never become Chomet. That's not our job in this world. Our job is to make matzah out of what could become chametz. Our job is to make matzah out of what could be chametz with the eight of over there. Nevertheless, to make sure it doesn't get there. That's it's a hard job, but that's the way the Chassam Sofer sees the job of a Jew in this world. What do you say to the Svartan? <laughs> Pardon? What do you say to the Svartan? They're not making the matzah out of, out, of, uh, <laughs> out of rice either. They can't. There is a beautiful Hidai quote uh, one of the great fired the acronym repeats of Ben Rebdov with the following idea on the Halachmania again we'll get past it eventually don't spend this much time on Halachmania at your Savior please <laughs> but you know you can choose pick and choose one for each night and I always tell my kids this you know different Torah that you have we can we can put it you know put it aside for later we can share it at the meal especially this year with the lateness of Yom Tov uh, it's going to be so late by the time you get to the meal. Nothing wrong with going through the Haggadah with some, you know, brief discussion and saying, okay, the longer and more intricate the Torah, we'll save for the meal. And I always tell my kids, you know, it's always the same thing. Kids come home with a stack this big, and I'll tell them, we've got eight days, plenty of time. It doesn't have to be done at the Seder. So, you know, but for some reason, whenever they don't get done at the Seder, <laughs> yeah, if you don't have the five Torah for the Shabbos meal, nothing. Not for the stack this big. <laughs> I don't know. You know, all of a sudden it's gone. But uh, the, the, the Chidah quotes from Yitzchak ben Rudav with the following idea. We say at the end of Alchmania, Hashata Hacha, Lashon Barat Yisrael. Hashata Avdei, Lashon Ben Rudav Yisrael. This year here, next year we're in Yisrael. This year we're slaves, next year we'll be free. So the, the, the Chidah says, what's the double wash? Right? We always want to know when, when you have. The same <coughs> idea repeated a second time, what's being it? See, this is the following beautiful idea. There's a Maimre Chazal, it doesn't say where it is, but it's a, it's a Medrash somewhere, that, that actually the, the waiting expectantly for redemption in and of itself becomes the key to redemption. There is a uh, famous Gemara, the Gemara is found in Shabbos and Laman Al, it's also found in Kedushin. The Gemara says that at May of Esrim Shana, 120 years we go upstairs, so we're going to be asked a series of questions. <coughs> there are, you know, there are questions that we're going to be asked. One of them is to see peace of the issue. Did you wait expectantly for redemption? Did you wait? Did you look? You know, they say over high Belash the Khabat time, they say they put a special begotten in their closet prepared. When Mashiach comes, they, they were ready. They were ready. So the the um, the Chidah says the following. Sometimes it's actually the fact that we looked forward to the Yeshua that brings about the Yeshua. And he brings a beautiful idea in the brachas of Shon Esri. Right? In the brach of Estzemach David Abdechot Tasmiya, so we say, the Kanatim Yeshua Secha, Ki Yeshua Sakhi So we would translate that normally as, right? Give us the salvation. Right? Break, sprout the, the, the sprout of David, your servant, right? Cause to sprout, right? Why? Before, I mean, not before we have waited all day, we wait expectantly for the redemption. He says, no, he doesn't mean for, that means because. Because, in other words, we ask for our redemption because we ask for our redemption. The fact that we're waiting all day is the reason in and of itself to redeem us. Says Reb Yitzchok and Reb David, that's the Pshadim of Hagadah. 
This year we're here. We're waiting expectantly the Shana Babayat Yisrael. We're going to end the Seder by saying the Shana Babi Yerushalayim. That hope and that expectation will in and of itself lead to Hashatav Day. The Shana Babayat Yisrael. This year we're slaves and next year we're free. So that in and of itself becomes the, uh, the vehicle to bring about the freedom. Uh, one of the questions that's always bothered me. Zionists would have an easier way of interpreting them. There are many other interpretations. This has been one of them. The Satan Reb also has another way of interpreting it. So, you know, you can go to, to uh, a lot of different places for that idea. I, I've always been bothered by this question, and, and I raise it at the Seder every year, and I ask my kids to come up with an answer to it. I want to share with you uh, the answer that Rokeach gives, and a beautiful idea from the Chidah based on it. The Gemara in Sachim brings down the admission, actually, of the Tovel, the Karpas. Right? We take the Karpas and we dip the Karpas. Right? So, why do we dip the Karpas? Because we're bugs. What's the reason the Gemara gives for dipping the Karpas? <laughs> So, the Gemara can say all that. The Gemara doesn't say Sabbath the Gemara doesn't say the tears. The Gemara doesn't say the possum. The Gemara says the reason we dip the Karpos is so the children should ask. Right? The children should ask. Ask any former student of mine. They know that when they ask the question, why do you do this and that, the answer is always, so the children should ask. I once had, many years ago, a student of mine was stopped by a Rebbe in Yeshiva for a dress code violation. And the Rebbe said, why are you wearing sneakers? And he said, so the children should ask. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't appreciate it. And he appreciated it less than he heard that he got it from me. <laughs> and if they ask, so, you know, children should ask, so he says, so I ask, they always say, but the, the Gemara says the, the child, we dip the carpus right after the, uh, right after Vanius, we do carpus, right? And the Kahneman Shoel, then the child asks the question. Right? Where's the answer? What do you answer the kid? So he's going to ask that we dip the carpus into the salt water or into some amount of vinegar in wine or in vinegar, and there's no answer. The Rokeach tells us two answers we should give the kids. The Rokeach, Rebbe Lazar of, of Worms, Germany, from the great Ashkenazi Rishonim, he says, I'm going to tell you two answers you should give the children as to why we did. One is that it's com it commemorates the beginning of the slavery in Israel. What about the slavery? So the dipping that we do is a, a, a commemoration of the Kojishim Kash the straw that they had to gather and then mix with water in order to create the mortar for the bricks. So that's one idea. Now, the second reason we dip, says the Rokea, the second answer you give the children is that it's also commemorating our freedom. Why? Says the Rokea, because it's the derech of B'nai Chorin to dip. When, when you are a slave, you are, you know, if you go, I don't want to equate it to slavery, but you know, if you're going to the uh, a, a lower class eating establishment, let's say, where you know your food comes in plastic trays, not that again, I'm not disparaging any chazal shalom, but you know, you don't have the luxury then of you know dipping in and sitting daintily dipping your food, right? You have to have a certain level of luxury and of comfort to daintily dip your food. Says the Rokeh. So we tell the children that just like we lean. And just like we, we drink four cups of wine, we do other actions that are symbolic of free men and women who can live like kings. So we dip in order to commemorate that. Says the, the Rokeh, those are the two answers you're going to give the kids. So the Chidal says, those are the two answers you're going to give the kids. Where are they? Why are they printed in Agatha? He says, they are. Why? He's going to say, Avodim Ayim Lefar Mitzrayim. We were slaves to the power of Mitzrayim. That's the first reason we did to remember the slavery that we, we suffered. And then the second one is, mm -hmm. 
God took us out. The second reason for dipping is to commemorate the freedom. So actually, the rokeach's two answers, says the Chidon, are built into the Agal. You just have to flesh them out. Right? They're built in, but you've got to pull them out. Always looking for a new perspective on the, on the Manishtan. Over the years, we've spoken about the Ramam's perspective. Manishtan is not really questions, it's really observations. It's not, it's not really the, uh, the child asking, as you pointing it out. The, the Chido has a beautiful, all-encompassing piece to try to capture, A, what each question really means, and B, how we answer the question. You know, my, my, my kids learned in Yeshiva, and I'm sure yours did too, that you know, to end off the Manishtan, they're either in, in English, Hebrew, or Yiddish, French. Right? Uh, whatever language it is. Actually, there's actually, I found the Lubavitcher Rebbe's Haggadah, believe it or not, I found a source for doing the, the Meinstein in different languages. Uh, a lot of people have a minig in their home doing all sorts of foreign language. And uh, the, the, there actually are Haggadahs that in the Haggadah and the, the, the Balatayim's Haggadah had it in there to write the words low A's after the Meinstein. Now, the word noise means to translate it into the foreign tongue. Why? Because there were parts of the Haggadah where the, the great Gidolim write, you have to be very careful to translate for those at the table who don't understand the language. It should be in a language everybody understands. In my house, we do the Haggadah entirely in Hebrew and English. I, I, the the, the Seder by me is not, is not relaxing. It's very, very draining. I spend the entire time going through. I do go around and have other people read, but, you know, it's read and translate, explain and discuss, you have to know. So, the comment low A's went in there, probably over the centuries, people took that to mean, because low A's means foreign language, do other foreign languages. So it became common to do the Manishtana in other foreign languages. But afterwards, so my child says to me, okay, Abba, Tata, I ask you four questions, where's my answer? Right? Now, that kid could wait a long time. He's not getting an answer in the Hagotah to why, you know, every other night is coming to matzah. Tonight is only matzah. Does not appear anywhere in the Hagotah. Every other night we don't dip. Tonight we dip twice. Maybe the were careful. We don't make it. Not. Every other night, right, we, we sit in leaning tonight. Not only leaning. And more, you know, and other vegetables tonight it's only more. So but we don't... Uh, I don't find the answer. Chidon has a beautiful piece to explain each one of the questions and how the phrase Avodim Hayil Lefar Mitzrayim, the Yosei Hashem Elokein Mishon, answers every question. It says the following: the first question the child asks is, "Every other night we eat chametz and matzah. Tonight we eat only matzah." What's his question? So he says the question is he's asking about the halachic issue I mentioned before, which is the following. The truth is, I can eat matzah without having to go through the whole rigmarole of all the, when we have two shiurim on products and cleaning, and the, you know, wouldn't it be easier if I could sit down at the Seder on my regular chomet tika tablecloth, on my regular chomet tika dining room, on my regular chomet tika kebab, I'll eat matzah. I can eat matzah. Why not? But you can't, why not? Because you have to get every single morsel and crumb of chametz away. Why do you have to get every single morsel and crumb of chametz away? Because of the fact that chametz is also the masha. Chametz, even the slightest amount of chametz is also. Okay, said Chido, that's really the child's question. Every other night, you want matzah? Okay, have chametz or matzah, right? There are plenty of people who eat matzah for shalashudas every week. We sit down at the table together. I have my chametz, there is matzah, you know. Show my Israel, no problem. So why is it tonight at this table we can have only matzah chametz has to be out, has to be gone? Says the Chidol, the following beautiful idea. He says that the we know that we were redeemed from Mitzrayim earlier than the appointed time. We got out early. It was an early dismissal from, <laughs> from Mitzrayim. Why? So we know, Chazal tells us, because we had descended to the 49th level of Tomo. And if we'd gone one level down, one drop further, it's it, done. No, there's no coming back. Says the Chidal, 
So what did Hashem do? Right? Hashem took, of, took us out of Mitzrayim early to prevent the hour of being completely absorbed in the tomb of Mitzrayim and being lost. That, like the Midrashim say, that's why Hashem had to do it himself. Because by rights, we weren't ready to go. By rights, it was not the time. The Roshim himself had to come and upend the order of things to take us out. Says the Chidol, that's really the answer to the Ben Chav, to, to the Ben, I'm sorry, to the, the question. What was the question? Why is it that we can't have a drop of Chavitz? Because Chavitz represents the Yetzirah of the Tomb. And we were that close. We didn't have any, any spare room. There was no buffer. We were that close to falling off the cliff. When you're that close, you can't say, okay, you know, a little bit's not going to hurt. So we, we ban any chametz at all. And then, Hashem took us out, so we eat matzo, but we ban the chametz entirely, even the littlest drop, because we were that close to falling off the cliff. The next question that Vigal says, the, the child asks about the vegetables. Every other night we eat all vegetables. This night we eat more. The Chidah says, I think the child's asking a different question. What's the question he's asking? So he says, I think the question he's asking is that if you're looking to commemorate the slavery, we already have the charosas on the table. We have another vehicle for commemorating slavery. Right? They already, the child's going to point out he did twice. The charosas. In fact, if you ask me, so the charos, I'm not a big charos as eater, but you know, the charos resembles the, uh, the mortar. And you, know, you put the red wine in, and it makes a, a, it's a, good, uh, it's a good mortar for bricks. I've never excuse me, actually tried building into a house, but I would suspect it probably would be better than some, some materials you buy in Home Depot. <laughs> right? But the, the charos says, so the, the son wants to know, I don't need another reminds you of slavery. I have the first. What's the moral? So he says the following. The moral adds another dimension to our remembering our servitude. What's the other dimension? The other dimension to remembering our servitude is that we not only were slaves, but it was a bitter experience. In other words, it wasn't just that there was shibu, there was koshi hashibu. There was the, the bitterness and, and the, 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 the terrible suffering of the slavery, but that bitterness allowed us to leave early. And that bitterness made, instead of, two, instead of 400 years, we can go back into 210 years. I once heard, this, I didn't make this joke, I would never make such a joke, but I once heard a joke that you know, a guy uh, told his friend in Shul, he said, wish me mazel I'm celebrating my 50th wedding anniversary. So his neighbor said, 50th wedding anniversary, was that your wedding? You got married 25 years ago. So you have a koshi ashibu. <laughs> yeah. I, I did not make that joke. Oh, I, I would not laugh at it. So it's the coach Yashiva, it's the suffering itself the Yahweh said earlier. The moral is that dimension. The moral is not just sheep and it's right. The moral is Vaimaru is Chayhem Babodal Kosha. They embitter their lives, they make them suffer. But the suffering at the end of the day is what saved them. Says the Chidol that we only merit for the suffering to get us out early if God looks at us as his children. And if he looks at us as his children, then we can go for it. Said the child, so why do we have the moral? The answer is, we were slaves to power we tried, we had a terrible time, we should have been there longer. But the Yotzeinu Hashem Elokeinu Mishom, God took us out early. And God Himself took us out early. That's why we have to commemorate the Koshi Hashim. And finally, says the Chidah, the last question the child asks is the simplest of all, but the most profound of all. The child says, every other night we eat, I love both the deer, I love both the language that the inference makes in the language. Shebecho elos onu ochlim, ben yoshvinu ben yisubin. What did I skip? Oh, um, twice. <laughs> dipping. Oh, sorry. The dipping was the answer before with the with the, the rokeah. Okay. The, the fourth one. The, 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 the dip one was the rokeah. The fourth one is the leaning 
versus the the sitting up straight. I always, you know, sometimes you get a question and you realize what was bothering you all the years. Sometimes it's always bothering you about the question, never knew what. So the the question is, every other night you eat sitting or leaning. So what does that phrase mean? Right? We always translate it as it's all done while leaning. Right? Meaning I was always taught, always thought that the phrase meant that every other night we do our meal part sitting, part leaning. Mm-hmm. Tonight we do it all leaning, which is not even true, except for the, the Shigov amongst us like myself who pull out a couch and actually sit there on the couch <laughs> leaning for the whole meal. But, but the, um, right, the words don't mean that. The words mean all other nights some people sit, some people lean. Tonight we're all leaning. It's a very different question. Leaning as opposed to... Sitting up straight. No, but you said that... What, what, what is your question here? Some people lean? Some people lean? Some people lean. You have to hear it, you should be able to know what the, the, the question in the Hanoda is, should call it those one of the big you should be able to do? Allah is a kulodim to do. Which is normally thought of as every other night we have a choice to eat whether sitting or leaning. Tonight we must lean. It's not what it says. What it actually says is all other nights we eat, some people sit, some people lean. Tonight everybody leans. It's a very different question, very different observation. Says the Chitab, what's the, what's the child observing? It's a chakra. Child is observing halacha in the Mishnah Arve Psalm. What's the Mishnah? The Mishnah Arve Psalm says, Afilu oni shebi Yisrael vod yochal ad Even the pauper, amongst the Jews, should not eat until he does his say. Until he leans. Says the Chidon, the child is asking the fellow. I get that rich people sit around the big fancy table and they lean. Why in the world is the poor person leaning? Why is the poor person, I look around and I see that, you know, neighbor never had a comfortable chair in his life, never leaned on a pillow, all of a sudden tonight he's sitting there like a king. That doesn't make sense to me. Says the Chidah, what's the answer? Tonight we're all kings. Because we were slaves to Par Mitzrayim. God took us out. Tonight we are all kings. I'll share with you a, uh, a vort. It's not my type of vort, but you know, I'll go out of my, my comfort zone. Some of you people like it. It's, 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 it's more Kabbalistic. The Chidah here cites from Mordechai Cohen, another Sephardic Godel, with the following. On the Avodim Hayim Lefar Mitzrayim, he says the following, and again, where he knows this from, I don't know, but he knows this. He says that Paro is actually a Gilgal of Kain. Paro is a reincarnation of Kain. And Hevel is a, Moshe rather is a Gilgal of Hevel. So that's why Paro wants to kill Moshe, because it's Kain and Hevel all over again. Right? It's Kain and Hevel, the sequel. <laughs> says the Chidal uh, that the Apostle tells us that God gave to Cain after Cain kills Hevel and Cain complains, what does God give him? He gives him an os. Right? So the word os means sign it also means a letter. a letter. What's the smallest of the letters? Yeah. The letter Yud. says the letter Yud. <laughs> What's the gematria of Pyro? <clears throat> I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you. The Gematria of Pyro was 355. What's the Gematria of Moshe? 345. How much does Pyro exceed Moshe by? A year. A year, 10. Right? 10 greater than Moshe. Now, the, he goes on, he says, Pyro was proud of his 10. Because he's 10 greater than Moshe. He didn't realize what was the 10 he was greater in. 10 Marcos. That was the os, was the ten makos, the osos uvumosai, the os of the makos was the debt he was given. Right? That's the ten. And he says the following, he quotes for Shlomo Lady Alkovitz, the author of the Luchodoti, with the following, Avodim, next three words, Hayinu Lefaro Gemitzrayim. What are the first letters of those next three words? Hayinu Lefaro Gemitzrayim. Hey, Maman, and Vez were the letters of Hevel. Hevel. 
So reverse, Heva. So I love making the fire of Mitzrayim, making the fire of Mitzrayim, but it was through Hevel, Moshe Rabbeinu, that we came out of Mitzrayim. It's a very capitalistic idea, the idea of the Gilgulim and those who come. Again, I'm not going to pretend to understand it, but for those who are excited about it, it's, a, you know, it's an exciting idea. Uh, the Chido adds in an idea, I'll give you two different shots on this. The Chido and the Tzam Sober, on the same thought, we go on in the Avod Ma'inu, and we say, "Afilu kolon chalim, kolon nevanim, kolon yod mesat." All right, if we're all wise, we're all understanding the Old Torah. Mitzvah olein l'saber mitzvah mitzrayim. It was a mitzvah for us to tell over the secret mitzvah mitzrayim. The whole amar of the saber mitzvah mitzrayim, raising the shabbat. The more you do, the better. So those two statements are a little bit non secular. There's one. There's a mitzvah to tell over the story. And number two, separate idea, call a Michael the Sap, raise a Meshubah, says the Chidol the follower. There's a question that many of the Rishonim ask. Simple question. The question is why is there no bracha on the mitzvah of Sipri Yitzhak Mitzrayim? It's a mitzvah. So we know when you engage in a mitzvah, you make a bracha. You light Hanukkah candles, so there's a bracha, lad near Shulchan, Asher, Kishan, and so so. It's one of like Yishkan. You sit in the sofa, it's a bracha. They ship a sofa. You light Shabbos candles, lot of Nirshan Shabbos. So why is there no bracha? I share Kibishan with Mitzvah Sofa and Sibanu. The Sabbath, we had Tias Mitzrayim. It's the Rashbam. Shabbat can both be the same answer. And they say that there's only a bracha on a mitzvah where the mitzvah is finite and measurable. You know, I can say, you did the mitzvah, you're done. So you light Hanukkah candles, you lit your one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight candles, finished. I did the mitzvah. You sit in the sofa, so it's a finite mitzvah, right? Even if you can spend all day, but it comes to a close. The, the mitzvah of Sipri and Sipri Mitzrayim is open-ended. It's open-ended. How long is it? You know, keep going, keep going, keep going. So the reason that we don't make a bracha is because there's no end to it. Says the that's really the segue here in the Haggadah. We say, Mitzvah Oleinu the Sabra Mitzvah Mitzrayim. It's a mitzvah. If it's a mitzvah, what are you going to ask? Why don't make a bracha? What's the answer? The Cholamayr of the Sabra Mitzvah Mitzrayim raise the Shabbat. Because there's value in adding and adding, so there's no bracha on the mitzvah. That's the Cholamayr of the Sabra. The rabbis of the name Brach who showed that. Right. right. The rabbis of the name who showed it. While you raise the story of the rabbis of Nebrach, I'll share another thought from the on that, which is the following. The, the, we bring down the stories of the rabbis of Nebrach, and then afterwards we bring down the Mishnah in Rachos that discusses a halacha not related to the Seder life. I've raised this question in past years. I've given Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky's and the Briskorov's perspective on it. He does a much simpler perspective. The Mishnah that we talk about, Omer Rebbe Lozav and Azariah, right? The Rebbe Lozav and Azariah, that was, for, for, I, for me as a kid, I think for most kids, that was the most exciting part of the Seder. Because we all knew that Rebbe Lozav and Azariah was 18 years old, and he had white white beard, and he grew white hairs, and that's how, you know, so we all knew that idea. And therefore, he was, you know, I am as 70 years old, Rebbe Chisi. So he tells over how he never merited to win the argument, carry the day, that Yitzhiya's Mitzrayim should be done at night, until Ben Zoma came along with his drasha, kol yimei chayach, yimei chayach ha'evim, kol yimei chayach ha'avim ha'levim, it's the end of the night, and the Chachomim dis- disagree, the Chachomim say no, that yimei chayach ha'olam hazeh, kol yimei chayach ha'olam hazeh, kol yimei chayach to bring to the days of Mashiach. So everybody points out, that Mishnah is a debate about whether or not there's an obligation all year long, tonight, last night, tomorrow night, to mention it's Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Nobody disputes the fact that there's an obligation to relate the story of Yitzhak Mitzrayim to the Seder. Nobody disputes that. So this mission is talking about an Alaka. It's not relevant tonight. And, and 300 and, well, the Hebrew count, 353 nights of the year, it would be appropriate to bring down that mission and discuss it. There's one night that it's not. The Seder. 
And it takes up valuable real estate, not other. <laughs> One. One. So the Shum Shadash. Shum Shadash. <laughs> so the Chidol, that's a beautiful shot. The Chidol says, we just got to say it. We could all be wise. We could all be understanding. We could all know Torah. We have a mitzvah to tell over Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Who says? Maybe not. Maybe, you know, once you know it all, you know it all. Says the Chidal, what's going to happen when Mashiach comes? So, Mola Ha'oretz Dasa Sashem, Kimayim Liyam Chasim, the world is going to be filled with such clear knowledge and recognition of God, like the waters that cover the oceans. Everybody's going to be Chachomim, Nivonim, Yodim, Esatar. And what? There's still a mitzvah, even then, to tell over Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Even then, there's a mitzvah to remember Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Mohammed Yitzhak Mitzrayim, Mashiach, says the Chidon, that's what we're proving here. We just got through saying, if we're wise and understanding no Torah, we have to say it, I'll prove it to you. Not, we're not bringing it in. Everybody thinks we're bringing it in for Benzomas to aid in the night. No, it's not what we're bringing it in for. We're bringing it in for the Chachonim who tell you that the mitzvah applies to Moses Mashiach, the Yetzirah Mitzrayim applies to those who are wise and knowing and knowledgeable. Well, I want to go back a bit and uh, tell you two chassam sofers. I think I'll tell you, we'll share two more chassam sofers and then maybe uh, my voice will have given out. I'll be done. I'll share with you one piece from the Lubavitch Rebbe that's going to be part of the Shabbos of Allah's Russia. You can't write in Shabbos of Allah. So I'll share with you that piece as well. Two chassam sofers, Lubavitch Rebbe, and then we'll call it a night. But Sam Sofer asks the same question that we showed him asked as to why there's no bracha on the Haggadah. No bracha on Sikh Yitzhak Mitzrayim. He gives a fabulous answer. Said to Sam Sofer, there is an obligation incumbent upon all of us, like I started to the Shir with, that the whole door by door. That means that we have to view it every year as if we have gone out from Mitzrayim. Well, where does the, the story of Mitzrayim start from in Nagadu? It starts not from really Abod Mahir. It starts from Mitrila Ovdi Abod Zori, I will say. Because my focus is Rav and Shmuel and the Gemara Misachim, where to start from. We go out of order, which is its own discussion. Why? But it really starts from originally our fathers were over there with the Zara. They weren't. They weren't Jewish. There was no such thing as a Jew. They all converted. Says the Chassam Sofer, the reality is we have to look at the night of the Seder as if it's our conversion night. We're going to go from non-Jews, from a different nation, to the conversion to being Jews, to being B'nai Yisrael. Says the Chassam Sofer, there's a halacha in Hilchos Geri. Allah in Hilchos Geri is the following. If a person becomes a Geri right. and goes to Mikvah, does he make a bracha before he goes to Mikvah? Why not? He not can make a bracha. <laughs> when does he make the bracha? <laughs> Afterwards, when he comes out. Because he can't say the Tivan before he commanded. Says the, says the Chassam Sofer, on the night of Pesach, we try to replicate the experience of being a foreign nation converting to Judaism. So we sit down to the same story. I can't make a bracha. I'm not I'm not high. I'm reenacting that I'm not high. When would you make the bracha? At the end, what do we do? I shared the Alonu Vagalabasenu. We make a bracha at the end. Says the Sam Sofer, the bracha at the end is the bracha. Like the gear who converts and makes the bracha at the end. So we reenact fully our inability to make the bracha and our ability at the end after we've reached that, that level of conversion. Okay. One more song. So fair. I, I, I love this song. So fair. So out of the box. So out of the box. You get a way of thinking. You know, I was raised and you were raised that there are four children. Right? The Chacham, who's also a Sadiq. Right? The Rasha. The Tom, the Shane of Daily Show, right? So you've got the four children. Uh, my, my son's first grade Rebbe 
sent him home from Yeshiva with Agoda, and in the Agoda he had his picture next to the Ben Chal. Oh. So I asked my son, who would Rebbe choose for the Rosh? <laughs> <laughs> He made every kid I got, obviously, but, you know, we, we read a chacham, that's the tzad. You don't, you, don't, you don't have to be a tzad to be a chacham, you don't have to be a chacham to be a tzad. But not one of the same. And the chassam sofer says, I'm going to tell you what the chacham asks, and what the father asks the chacham. And so, chassam sofer, it's such a classic, it's very much in his way of thinking as well. He says the chassam sofer, the chacham is a wise child. Tzadik or not, I don't know. But he's very smart. And what's the inclination of a smart child? Says the Chassam Sofer, the smart child wants to teach me everything and I'll go learn something else. You know, let me get it all, I'll figure it out, I'll know it, let me move on. Says the Chacham wants to know, Ma hoidus v'achukim v'mishpatim asher tzivu asher v'akeinu eschem. Says, teach me all the laws, I'm done with that, I'll go learn something else, I'll go study with the Chassam Sofer. Says, Chacham Yivan I'll go study philosophy, I'll still go study Greek wisdom. I, I want to move on to something else. Says the Chassam Sofer, the father's job is to tell the son, like the Gemara Menachos says, Torah is, is constant. You may know it, all, you keep learning it, and you don't push it aside from the faith. So what do you tell the child? Even after you're done with the Pesach, there's no dessert afterwards, you keep going. And it's beautiful, the Chassam Sofer's perspective, why do we use the Greek word? He wanted to study Greek wisdom. So we use Afikom, aim after your nephew, So the Chacham is he not, not, not a side, not a Russia. He's a kid who wants to, you know, wants to know. The father's job is to guide him as to what the proper approach in, in Torah is. I'll, I'll whet your appetite briefly with the Shabbos Hakobal Drosha, which I, I, I've changed the title somewhat. The, the, the title's going to be A Tale of Two Stars. Oh, it's not a subtext of writing a get on a piece of matzah, but yeah. tell to start. So, can't give it in Israel. Can't give it in Israel. Oh. Uh, yeah, uh. right. Well, it's, it's, the, it's the one savior that's divided into two, so <laughs> I can't. But I have to change the title to get people to come. But the the uh, the Babacher Rebbe in the Haggadah um, cites a Avudraham. Avudraham cites a Yerushalmi. We don't have the Yerushalmi. Not an hour. Yerushalmi, he cites Yerushalmi. He had this text in Yerushalmi. Yerushalmi raises the following question on Allah. On our Seder plate, you've got a lot of strange things. You know, we don't think much about it, you know, which is good, really. You know, my Seder plate looks like my mother's Seder plate. Looks like her mother's Seder plate. Looks like her mother's Seder plate. And, that, and that's the way it should be. But part of our Seder plate, the Mishnah says in Arabic Sachim, we take Shnei Tavshil, two cooked foods. One, Zecher the Pesach. One is to commemorate the Korban Pesach. And one is Zecher the Chagigah to commemorate the Korban Chagigah. So, what are those two foods that we take? We take a Zroa, a shank bone, and a roast today. The Zroa on the shank bone is to remember the Korban Pesach. And the roast today is the Korban Chagigah. This one, as a kid, I, I was, you know, beside myself with this one. There is no Korban from an egg. <laughs> you cannot bring an egg as a car. No such thing. So, why in the world are we putting a roasted egg on the Seder plate, the Zeher of the Korban Chagigah? And if you're going to tell me, it's because we don't want to put roasted meat on it because we don't want it to look like we're eating kachin outside of Esau Mikdash. It's sitting next to a roasted shank bone. It's right there. That always also bothered me. Why the shank bone? For the Korban Pesach. The Korban Pesach is a, an entire roasted animal. The head, the tail, the whole thing. Roshal, Kronov, Al Kirbo, it's the entire thing on his fit. You know, why the shame from? So the, the Avudram cites Yushal. And Yushal, he says, there's really a play on words. There's really a play on words, it's really a tzvila. What's the tzvila? So in Aramaic, the word for egg is bear. Bear. The word for egg is bear. The word for request or ask is ba'a, or boy. Same word, same root. Be'a and ba'a, like ba'a mine. Says the Yerushalmi, where the Avutaram brings it down, says the Yerushalmi, that we put on our Seder plate 
an egg next to the Zroa. Bo'o, we ask that God should redeem us, Bizroa Netuya, like he redeemed our forefathers. Mm. So it's really uh, a symbolic, subtle request on our Seder plate that God should redeem us as he did our forefathers with that outstretched arm. That's why it's a Be'a and this Zroa, yet also commemorates the Karba, but it's, it's, at its core, it's a prayer to bring us back to that and redeem us with these Zroa Netuya, with the outstretched arm, when I say this over on Shabbos, you can just pretend you didn't know it yet. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll stop here.